Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear ministers, dear guests. Welcome to the third and the last day of the 2013 International Transport Forum here in Leipzig. My name is Monica Jones. It's my pleasure to spend the next two hours here with you discussing urban and uh, regional mobility and, of course, focusing again on the question who pays for it all? Because as you know, the main theme of this year's Congress was funding transport, and I'm sure you already attended a lot of hopefully very informative discussions on the issue, starting from understanding the issue, taking action, and today connecting regions. That's what we will focus on in the next two hours. But before we do so, I would like to hand over to the mayor of Leipzig, Mr. Jung, who has come here to us this morning to share a few words with us. So please give him a round of applause. Eins, eins, yeah. Thank you very much, Monica, for this greeting and good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Guten Morgen. Ich hoffe, Sie haben gut gesch Good morning. I hope you slept very well. Gilgash, good morning to you, to all of you. It's a pleasure to say some greetings and some, some thoughts about our issue tomorrow morning. As mayor, I would like to welcome you all. And with more than a half million inhabitants, I know, of course, who pays. In doubt, the city, huh? In doubt, the city. Um, but as I understand the question of the panel, the focus of discussion must be much wider. First, let's not just talk about infrastructure, but our mobility, walking, cycling, public transport, individual transport, means a lot of different modes. There are particular costs for the users and the providers. Cities are never alone in this field. They are always cooperating with their surrounding cities and region. Private partners and 
individual conditions. And are most likely the destination for a lot or even most of the daily trips of commuters. Second, the question who pays has a lot of different aspects. Let me name just some. For example, who pays for our mobility today and who will pay in the future? We know that our way of transport causes a lot of external effects that are a burden on different people today and on future generations. We also know that because of our demographic changes, there will be the question who will be able to, to maintain our transport infrastructure in the future. Another important question, I think, is uh, who pays for what? Are the users paying enough for the infrastructure they use? It's just the responsibility of the cities to maintain and pay for the urban infrastructure like streets, tram tracks, bicycle tracks, public transport stations. How will the cities be enabled to finance their share of the cost of infrastructure, especially when they, are, when they carry the weight of transport of the whole region? It can't be fair for people living in cities to pay for all this while others living in the country outside. Do not. Especially people living in suburban agglomerations have the highest need for a safe and quick mode of transport because their distances traveled daily are usually much higher than of those living in the inner city. So I'm very curious in the outcomes of the panel discussion, and I would especially like to know if there are new ways to finance public transport, the infrastructure and the opening. Even if Leipzig is maybe a model of the type of European city, a tram city, maybe you've seen it, it's the second, second biggest tram, tram system in Germany after Berlin. On a national level, we are a state a sustainable city in the field of quality of life and urban infrastructure. But we are always eager to learn from others, from our experience, from your experience and your good ideas. That's what helps us to develop our city even further. For the panel, I wish you a fruitful discussion. And for those who will have the time and energy in the afternoon, if it won't rain, I hope you will enjoy me on a bicycle tour. I wish you some motivating first-hand experience about sustainable transport in Leipzig. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Jung. And uh, just like last year, I can only recommend uh, do join the bicycle trip uh, through Leipzig. It's a beautiful city, and uh, cycling through a city, I think, is the best way to explore the architecture, and a bit of fresh air doesn't do any harm. Even a bit of rain doesn't do any harm. Now, you already mentioned uh, pretty much uh, what this session and what the last three days were really all about. Now, the Canadian Transport Minister yesterday in another session reminded me of the fact that money does not grow on trees because we had a session about how to best uh, fund. Uh, it was cross-border networks in that respect. And uh, the discussion moved further and further away from the actual funding aspect and more about how to um, improve the cross-border networks in different ways with uh, soft mechanisms. Um, and that led me to the conclusion that all right, Money obviously isn't a problem, and he reminded me, oh, no, that is wrong. Money does not grow on trees, so we have to make sure that we know what to do with it, where to get it from, in order, in this case, what we talk about today, ensure long-term sustainability and economic viability to make a city worth living. Now, obviously, there are a lot of challenges on the way. We need to have uh, roads for cars be it private cars or taxis or trucks or uh, buses, of course. We need to have tracks for railways, subways, trams. We need to have pavements for pedestrians. And uh, in more and more cities, like in Leipzig also, a very special 
infrastructure is growing for cycling, which is becoming more and more important. And ideally, all these various modes of transport infrastructure should be integrated, which isn't always easy to achieve. So today, in this session now, we would like to explore some lessons uh, that could be learned from various cities how they implement various mechanisms, how they maybe also already implemented new forms of urban scale instrument, um, institutional arrangements and uh, innovative funding mechanisms, which is of course very important for us today. And uh, I would like to ask first of all to join me here on stage two representatives uh, from the operating side. That is uh, Sir Peter Hendy, who is the Commissioner for Transport for London, United Kingdom, and uh, Dimitri Pronin, the Deputy Head of Department for Transport and Road Infrastructure Development, the city of Moscow in Russia. Please join me on stage and please give them a warm hand. Good morning. So make yourself comfortable here. So um, I would like to ask uh, start with you first of all. Uh, since we last spoke, uh, you've been knighted. Yes. Uh, congratulations. So it's now Sir Peter Hendy, commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire, uh, which I'm sure has also to do with the fact that you were instrumental in the successful operation uh, for London Transport during the London Olympics last year. It all ran smoothly, I understand. It was okay. It was, it was, okay. It was okay. It was okay. All right. So that's British understatement there. Um, now, we all know that uh, London uh, doesn't have uh, the most modern network. It's, it's one of the oldest networks still up and running. And uh, so the question is, how did you manage to keep it up and running successfully? And especially, of course, how do you finance it all? So uh, thank, thank you, Monica. And it's, uh, it's very good to be here this morning. Uh, you're absolutely right. We're, uh, London is an old city. Uh, we have the oldest metro in the world. Uh, we also have a growing population, uh, 9 million to, uh, uh, we'll be at 9 million by 2018. It's growing by 60 or 70,000 people a year. Uh, and we've got the highest number of public transport passengers for many, many years. So we need to upgrade the capacity. Uh, we need, well, we need to upgrade the infrastructure to increase the capacity and also build new lines uh, and, uh, uh, and create new services. But we're also living in a world where uh, government is uh, reducing its spending. So the first thing to say is that the, co the proportion of costs paid by passengers and users is getting higher. We have fares increases every year at uh, the retail price, de price index plus one. Other charges like congestion charge and fines are going up because the users are paying a greater proportion of uh, the cost of, of transport in, in this world city. Um, the government our government grant, our grant from the uh, central government is going down, uh, but we have had two long-term funding plans for infrastructure and for revenue, uh, two five-year plans since 2005. Um, my current plan runs out at the end of 2015-16, uh, and at that stage, we, or, or now, we're arguing for um, what happens in very difficult um, economic circumstances. So I think the first point I'd make is that we've made enormous progress by having uh, funding plans which have lasted for uh, a multi-year period. We've had two five-year plans. They've created massive efficiency in spending, a reduction in costs of doing the same work, signalling costs on the uh, metro down by 60%. We've given our suppliers certainty. We've created jobs and we are able to better manage uh, that uh, uh, the, the, the capital works. The second point is that an old-style public corporation would have done everything uh, itself. It would have been entirely public sector. We're not like that anymore. We live in a mixed economy. We have private sector contractors. We have operators of the bus service of some of the railway network on gross cost contracts. Um, and uh, we, are, we have both reduced costs, uh, but we're better able to take the revenue risk so the contracts are gross cost contracts. Um, our engineering and maintenance is a mixed economy. A lot of it's in the private sector with conventional supply contracts from people who supply vehicles, road and rail vehicles, maintenance, track, signals, etc. Um, a third point is we have tried public-private partnership. 
Um, I'm sure there will be some discussion about this this morning. Famously, the infrastructure of the Metro was put out to PPP contractors and it was a failure. It was a failure because the condition of the assets was unknown. The consortia who were put together were unable to manage either together or to take sufficient risk. And although we still use private contractors, we still have some of the elements of those consortia doing that work, we are now much more economically able to manage it effectively ourselves. Uh, and I think particularly uh, there was a question about the unknown, uh, uh, the, the unknown condition of the assets which made uh, those commercial contractors very risk averse. Um, we've also had mixed experience with long-term uh, build, operate and maintain contracts um, where actually the commercial circumstances of the operation changed. So we've had to take some of those back in-house in, in as well. Um, clearly government funding is cheapest where it's available. Uh, and uh, in fact we've just demonstrated to government and to ourselves that conventional train procurement from a private sector contractor for the new east-west line across London will be cheaper and better done on a conventional supply contract. But there, there are some projects where you can uh, have the whole thing put out as a package. Um, we've built a cable car, we've got uh, a very large amount of uh, private sponsorship for that uh, and clearly the Mayor is contemplating uh, a new river crossing, a new underground road crossing which will be capable of entirely of private finance mm -hmm. because the income will be derived from, uh, from tolling. I think the last uh, piece of innovation that I'd like to t tell you about briefly is about uh, our biggest project, Crossrail, which is a £16 billion project for a cross London uh, railway link, where actually the supply contracts are quite conventional. They're with private sector civil and electrical, mechanical, railway engineering people. But the funding methodology is a mixture. It's a mixture of government money, it's a mixture of money from the city, and it also has private sector uh, money in there because of uh, a sponsorship from uh, big, big private in interests uh, like Canary Wharf, which is a new city to the east of London, um, and also a, uh, effectively a, 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 a business rate tax on property in London which will increase in value as a consequence of the scheme and therefore can, be paid, uh, can, can pay over a number of years for part of the project. And we've just announced another extension of the Metro to a huge development site just, just near central London on the south side, uh, Vauxhall and Nine Elms, where similarly there's a government loan backed by a uh, government guarantee and, and will be funded and repaid by future property taxation derived from the growth in value of the land uh, which is better served by public transport. Um, Monica, my conclusion is just to go back to the beginning, which is to say however the funding methods are derived, the thing that we've derived most value from is having a, is having a long term plan. Mm -hmm. We saved so much money by having a long term investment plan um, that, uh, that I believe that the, that the case for that in urban transport is very considerable, in fact incontrovertible, and that's what I'd like to leave you with. Thank you. Okay, well, well, well thank you, uh, Peter Hindi there. It, it, it sounds to me like a, a, in order to get a long-term investment plan, uh, that's going to be very difficult with private investors, I, because that's it's in the nature. Well, I think, I think Cro Crossrail, for example, is, 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 is an example of where you can do that. The project is lasting effectively for eight or nine years. The money uh, derived from the business rate supplement uh, is over 30 years. Uh, it's a deal because people can see that the deal works. The money from Canary Wharf, which is uh, uh, one single large developer of a small city of offices, um, is also uh, actually is put in during the construction. Mm -hmm. I don't think, it's, I don't think it, it's, it's a contradiction that people can enter into, into uh, public-private deals over a prolonged mm -hmm. period of time, but they have to be certain of the result. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, then I would like to, to know from you, uh, Dmitri Pronin, and I probably also need to get my headset for this as well. Um, so just uh, to introduce you again, Deputy Head of the Department of Transport and Development of Road and Transport Infrastructure of the Moscow Government. Um, and you've been quite busy there as well uh, lately. What, what role does the, the private sector play in Moscow's public transport? How do you get them on board and on what basis? Добрый день. 
Uh, hello, friends, uh, colleagues, good morning. Uh, it is a great discussion this morning, and I would like to share in that discussion. Uh, before I answer your question, I would like to welcome everybody, and I would like to inform you what is going on in uh, Moscow. I would like to give you some information about what is going on in Moscow, some figures so that we know what we talk about. In Moscow, we have 11.5 million population. And uh, the whole conurbation comprises 15 million, in fact. Uh, in 2012, uh, we uh, uh, spread out even further, and uh, the surface area grew uh, and doubled, in fact. So uh, transport had to catch up and uh, has to grow uh, and, and double, in fact, as well, in order to guarantee mobility of the citizens in Moscow. In order to understand those figures, let me say the following. In 2012, in Moscow, uh, we had uh, 4.5 billion passengers the transport system in uh, Moscow, uh, a lot comes into play. Of course, we have uh, roads, so buses, uh, trams, we've got uh, the tube, and we have regional trains. And uh, to uh, give you some figures, uh, the, the figures are as follows. Of those 4.5 billion, 2.3 billion used uh, the tube, 1.7 billion used uh, buses uh, and uh, uh, buses, uh, electrical buses, and about half a billion uh, trips were with railway uh, trains or regional trains. In 2012, Moscow passed a program. Uh, so it's called 1216, uh, uh, going from uh, 2012 to 16 for short-term development of transport in Moscow. First, we took this ro route and did some short-term planning to bridge uh, the next couple of years, to weather the next couple of years, and to give you some, some figures again, uh, the overall financing is to the tune of uh, 2.3 billion rubles in euros. Uh, that is uh, 570 billion euros, so, which is a huge figure. And that can be split up in different ways. So this uh, total sum. So there is money from uh, the government, uh, from the city, and private money as well. And private money is very important. And in the future, the share of private monies is to grow uh, within the framework of this program. Uh, this is very important for us. Uh, in, in fact, this is vital for us. So, what else could I say? This program, perhaps you could be uh, a bit more specific on it, and which, which role will it take? Uh, yes, we have uh, private monies, as is the case uh, in other cities as well, and this is also the experience of other uh, countries. Uh, this is private money uh, for infrastructure uh, projects or coming from infrastructure uh, projects, for instance, buildings along roads and streets or railway stations or other stations where uh, tracks are being built. So in the town, we have to uh, try and create conditions that it is attractive for private investors. So uh, this is a give and take. We are not uh, trailblazers. We are not pioneers here. Nothing pioneering. It's, it's going on for a long time, and we've had a long, uh, long-standing experiences. So we want to use what is best in other countries and implement that. Sounds a bit also like um, not that far removed from, for example, uh, the example you made uh, of, of, of Canary Wharf. Uh, again, it's, it's not exactly private sector is not involved in the actual uh, infrastructure in terms of uh, the, the 
tracks, for example, which uh, in England wasn't uh, such a good experience, uh, but in infrastructure surrounding it, which is also a way to uh, recover costs for private uh, sector. Well, uh, uh, interestingly, Monica, in the case of Canary Wharf, they're, they're, they're in fact, their, co their financial contribution is building a station but not equipping the tracks. It's building, a, yeah. it's build, building an underground station, which is a formidable undertaking uh, and is worth several hundred million. But uh, I'm, I mean, I think these contributions, as uh, Dimitri was saying, can take many forms. Mm -hmm. Before I let you go, um, you mentioned something um, that uh, the five-year plan, two five-year plans in a row, uh, that's a thing of the past. The next five-year plan is not yet... Well, it's, it doesn't exist yet, and there is no clarity yet whether it will exist. What if there is no five-year funding, long-term funding anymore? I, I think the, uh, uh, most of my personal time, most of the time of the organisation, most of the time of the Mayor at the moment, uh, is in order to make this argument, because these arguments are, are critical. Uh, I've worked in uh, Transport for London and its predecessors without a long-term financial plan, uh, and it's very difficult to get major infrastructure works done. They cost a lot of money, and you waste a lot of money. So we don't contemplate not having a far, uh, another plan. Uh, we know that we have to make this argument, uh, and I believe that the argument is very sustainable. Okay. Um, thank you very much for now. And I can invite you now to take a seat over there in our nice, comfortable sitting area over there because we will continue our discussion in just a moment. Thank you very much, Dimitri Pronin and uh, Peter Hendy. Very nice, very nice of you, thank you very much. Now I would like to ask the next two panelists, and I just wanted to point out uh, that this headset does not work, so I'm not quite sure if we still need it, uh, but it doesn't work. Uh, our next two panelists I would like to ask now is uh, Per Als. He's uh, the Chief Transport Executive of Copenhagen Municipality in Denmark. Please uh, also give him a warm welcome. And uh, he's joined by Hans-Werner Franz, the CEO of the Transport Network Berlin Brandenburg in Germany. And uh, I would like to start with uh, Per Als. First of all, congratulations. Uh, Copenhagen has been chosen uh, as the European Green Capital 2014. Correct. 2014. Um, tell us a bit, um, how do you pay for all the measures necessary to make a city like Copenhagen smart, green, and uh, so successful in uh, public transport terms? Well, uh, getting the money is, is the key issue here <laughs> and uh, contrary to many people's beliefs uh, transport is highly profitable there is enormously profitable uh, the economics of creating mobility and transportation is really uh, in and of itself something where you really should float in money our problem is that we are short of cash because all the good things we do all the uh, good effectiveness we create for society, just like we saw with the, uh, the jobs at the introductory movie uh, here. Uh, it's difficult for us to get the cash to take all the benefits which everybody else get out of the system and then get it into our own funding mechanism. Uh, we simply need a way where we are able to get uh, get hold of all the benefits, uh, exchange them into uh, economic terms, exchange that into cash and then for some time keep it and then reinvest it in the industry. Uh, it's, um, uh, we have, uh, it's, it's like when you're, if you're in the desert, you need water there's actually lots of water out there. It's just evaporated, it is in the air. But you need a, a mechanism to get drops out of it, to collect it and put it in a bucket, and hopefully be able to keep the bucket for yourself. Our view of, uh, of creating a green city, a smart city, and so forth, those are really parts of a, of, a, of a greater, more comprehensive view. We have the idea that 
uh, like was mentioned in, uh, for London, that we need long-term plans. We need to see where do we want to be in 10, 15, 20 years, and then make plans how to get there. Not so that we decide exactly now what we will do in 2023, but so we know what we should do now. The long-term plan goal is to figure out do we want to go north or south now. It's not to figure out specifically how we are going to uh, clear some obstacle a long time out in the future. We have on, uh, we have made a long-term financial plan seeing the demographics and expected uh, uh, trends in society. Uh, we have on the on the, uh, the physical side, the physical planning, land use plan, we made decisions about where we want to do things, in which order we want to do things. And on transportation, we have formulated a very, very simple uh, overall policy saying that at least one third of the trips in Copenhagen should be taken by uh, bicycle, at least one third be taken by public transportation, and at most one third by car. Now, people living in Copenhagen, working in Copenhagen, we live up to that. Our problem is people coming into the city, they come in two large numbers, not using public transportation or not using the bikes. Uh, but once they're in, in our city, then we have a very good system. We're working uh, so that it is possible for people actually to live up to this once they are in the city. And then we are in close cooperation with the state about securing good suburban rail infrastructure and service so that people actually have a choice, a good choice, of going by public transportation into uh, the city. We need all this money. The key is value capture. Uh, being with a bunch of economists here, the issue of uh, the logic of collective action and uh, the free rider problem is really, uh, those are, are really key issues here. Uh, we have in, uh, in Copenhagen created a metro by Newtown principle. We had a piece of land, owned it together with the state, putting that piece of land into a company and letting the company take the money from the rising real estate uh, values. That has provided the basis for putting in an automated metro in Copenhagen. The idea was graciously stolen from the Ducklands and we are very happy for that, for that steal. Since uh, the Viking Age, this is the best we got. Uh, the second phase of this is now in a, in a slightly changed version being put into place. We have a harbor area which is being developed and money from that goes to pay for the, uh, for the circle metro which will enhance the, the center parts of Copenhagen and it has a link out to the North Harbor which is being developed. So we actually, through the public ownership of this area, we also fund in here. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we're looking into a third uh, phase of, uh, of metro building where we do not have so much public ownership in, that, in those areas. And this is really where it gets tricky when we need to bring in private capital here. We hope that we'll be able to, to find some direct mechanisms, something like what we see in the US, the TOD, Transit Oriented Development, where we can strike deals locally. We have a fancy that at some point we'll get as modern as London so we can steal the second idea there, that is the real estate taxation in connection with the cross rail. Uh -huh. It's a marvelous scheme. I'm sure economists have, uh, have worked uh, uh, very much on this, but I think the real fancy thing is that it has been sold to the public and that is a really major, uh, a major effort. So um, I think that in this area, as I said, it's hugely profitable. We have to create very good relation state, uh, the city, state, private uh, sector, forced like it is in, uh, in uh, London now with Crossrail or voluntary like you could do it with TOD. Um, but in this case, it's uh, with just like United, uh, Manchester United, as they have their uh, motto, which is united we stand. The other part of that phrase is divided we fall. I prefer, prefer the former for the latter.
United we stand. Well, thank you very much, Fair uh, Isles. Uh, from what you just said, I believe that the timing must play a very important role in, in value capture. I mean, you mentioned this uh, example about this piece of land there that was uh, eventually for sale for a company that would then help invest in the public transportation built in that direction. So it was a win-win situation for both of it. But that means there was at a time where selling land um, at a price that was also still interesting, so that the recovery of this investment was uh, a given. Yes, absolutely. Ability, uh, timing, timing is really crucial here. If you're out early and you can make uh, a decision on, fin on financing before the fact, before you actually go into something, you have a much greater opportunity for uh, uh, gathering the vapor and uh, getting the rubs and, and, and filling your bucket. If it's after the fact, then, well, it's like the flute player from Hummel, <laughs> where uh, once the rats were out of the city, nobody cared to pay him. Exactly here, you have to make the, the clear agreement early on, mm -hmm. and then people will work together so they have uh, common goals. A very important point, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, um uh, Mr. Franz uh, is the CEO of the uh, Transport Network Berlin Brandenburg in Germany, You're also the president of the European Metropolitan Transport Authorities. Uh, when you listen to the uh, Copenhagen example, it also reminds me of what uh, the uh, EU Green Capital Awards Secretariat, uh, Mr. Rudden said. He said that Europeans have not just a right to live in cities, but to have a good life in a city. How does Berlin Brandenburg finance its public transport to ensure that people there have a good life in the city? I think uh, Copenhagen has a very good system and special the integration of the, uh, the bicycles and the system is uh, very good self than Copenhagen. In uh, Berlin we are a member of the EMTA, you said, and EMTA is uh, the Metropolitan Transport uh, Authorities in Europe. We cover 28 of these authorities like London, Copenhagen, Paris, uh, uh, Warsaw, Berlin and so on. And our members uh, work that they plan, promote, coordinate and organize uh, public transport and uh, our aim is to integrate all means of public transport and uh, to create more value for money, improve the quality and balance the fair policy. These are the main aims uh, from the EMTA. Uh, in Berlin Brandenburg we have a difference uh, to other uh, metropolitan areas that we have uh, organization with the Verkehrsverbund Berlin Brandenburg. Is uh, this organization include both states, the state of Berlin and the state of Brandenburg. And we integrated all means of public transport. And that's uh, mean special the problems you said from Copenhagen, that the ration uh, uh, is not interested to bring the people in the city uh, with public transport. Mostly they come with a private car. We organized it together. Mm -hmm. And the state of Brandenburg is also a member of the, uh, the uh, Verkehrsverbund Berlin Brandenburg, and we can plan from the uh, beginning to the end of the journey of the uh, uh, passengers that they uh, uh, use public transport. And for us, it's uh, very important to find uh, the different. Uh, uh, finance uh, sources. Uh, in Germany we have a special situation uh, that uh, since the states are responsible for the national trains, the national state uh, give every year seven uh, billions uh, of euros, uh, euros to the 16 states and we organize uh, with this uh, money the national trains and the national trains is also in Berlin, the S-Bahn system. Uh, this is a very important uh, source uh, for us. Uh, the other source is uh, that uh, the cities uh, pay for uh, the bus system and uh, for the tram system and uh, for the subway system. And what is uh, the most important source for us, it's the revenue from the passenger. Mm -hmm. 
And in our case, in Berlin Brandenburg, we have a balance. We have 50% uh, uh, of our cost is covered uh, from the passenger and 50% uh, from the taxpayer. And uh, the taxpayer for the national, for the state, and for the city, they all pay for public transport. We in Berlin special have problems uh, to bring a congestion charge or so. Mm -hmm. Berlin is a very young city. It's, uh, uh, it's developed in the last century and we have very large streets, uh, avenues, we have no problems uh, with space, so uh, uh, the private cars owner have no problem. We have to uh, have not the possibility to bring congestion charge. What we do is, uh, as a special source, uh, we uh, we um, look how can we bring more value for money, and that means we use uh, the uh, competition. We use the competition to uh, bring in uh, tendering uh, to bring all uh, different uh, companies in a tendering process and uh, then we can organize uh, higher quality uh, and the less price for the service contract. This is for us a very successful story. We had uh, the biggest uh, tendering uh, process uh, three years ago in Germany with 20 uh, four million train kilometers and in this t at the end of the tendering process we had completely uh, new trains and we uh, reduced the cost uh, per year for 25 percent and it's a lot of money and with this uh, money we can invest uh, in the system and can bring uh, more connections uh, special from the nation in the city and this is our, it's a, the most increasing sector for a new passenger is from around the city of Berlin in the city of Berlin. Mm -hmm. This is for us uh, uh, very important and it works very well. And the other point is uh, different to uh, some what we heard the last years in Germany. We have a common sense that the, that the train infrastructure should be owned by the state or the city. We have no private uh, train infrastructure structure in Germany and that means that uh, the uh, public uh, uh, should pay for the infrastructure. And this is, this is always a political discussion but at the end of the day our political uh, leader acts uh, accept that we need a very good infrastructure. Without the infrastructure, we have problems with the economical and social uh, development. And uh, this is different. But the service, the service we organize uh, in, in tendering process, in competition, and this uh, works very well. Mm -hmm. And the last point is we uh, look that we uh, get more passengers every year and the revenue from the passenger is also a very important source uh, to finance our system. I, I was, I was just, uh, just very briefly w wondering to ask, because I, I live in Berlin and I know that uh, passenger fares, they are fairly low compared to many other main cities. And you say that uh, the transportation system there is financed by 50% by passenger fare and the other 50% by taxpayer. So uh, how, how sound is this financing? Is it actually profitable? The whole, system is, the whole system is not profitable, so otherwise we need not the, the taxpayer. <laughs> but uh, you have to know in Central Europe, especially in Germany, to use a car is very cheap. It's very, very cheap. You have, as a car driver, you have not to pay for the road, you have not to pay for the bridge, and, and so on. It's very, very cheap. And if uh, in the times that the car using is so cheap, we cannot uh, bring a, a public transport system that is profitable. It's I not see. possible. And the other point is uh, we have the philosophy in Germany that uh, public transport uh, should be a system for all, for all people, for 
people with a high income, with a low income, people who, uh, who are handicapped, for all people should be the system. This is very important, and it means we have to have a balanced uh, uh, fair price, and, and uh, this means we cannot uh, increase uh, the price for public uh, transport like the price in, in Tokyo or in other parts of the world. Uh, our most competitors, uh, private car, is very cheap in okay. Germany. Now that you mentioned Tokyo, that is just the perfect link for the time being, Per Als and uh, Mr. Franz. Uh, thank you very much for the moment. I can invite you now as well to take a seat over there, make yourself comfortable, and uh, if you still have the strength, a round of applause for the two gentlemen. The next two gentlemen I would like to ask uh, up on stage is uh, Michael Melanifi, President and CEO of American Public Transportation Association, in short, APTA, United States. Not sure if I pronounced it correctly. I've been practicing. It's, 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 it's an interesting name, but it's Melanifi. 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 Okay, got it now. And uh, second, I would also like to uh, call up on stage uh, Masoku Vashisu, President, Japan International Transport Institute, in short, GT from Japan, obviously. Thank you very much for joining me here. How are you both? Fine, Very good. Very fine, good. good. Um, and I would like to uh, start uh, with you. Me? I would like to start with you, if, that, if that's okay with you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, it also just fits with what Mr. Franz says. Uh, the uh, public transport system in Tokyo yeah. can afford to demand high passenger fares. And there are many reasons for that. Uh, and you will fill us in there why Tokyo is so profitable in terms of public transport. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. I'll explain about it. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> briefly. Uh, yes, I have prepared <coughs> PowerPoint here. Uh, <coughs> I explain uh, along these uh, PowerPoints. So, the, compared to the other large cities in the world, uh, urban transportation in Tokyo metropolitan area uh, can be characterized. First, uh, it's extremely high railway uh, modal share, so which is shown on this uh, <coughs> chart. Uh, Tokyo is uh, <coughs> very high uh, usage of uh, railway transport. And second, uh, as Monica said right now, that its railway operation uh, without any subsidies from the government. That, that means it's profitable. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, uh, so uh, it is, uh, you know, today uh, I'd like to explain why the uh, railway business in Tokyo is uh, so remunerative. Yes. Uh, first, uh, you have to uh, see the idea, uh, <coughs> geological, uh, geographical idea of Tokyo. Uh, start with, let's look at the structure of the railway network in Tokyo uh, area. The first, there are the 35 kilometers uh, circular line, uh, which is uh, the same scale as the peripheric in Paris. There is a subway network that runs inside the circular line. And uh, there's around 30 uh, suburban, uh, suburban lines that extend out from the uh, circular line in a radial fashion. The suburban lines are the foremost char characteristic of all. Uh, they transport many commuters and students every day from residential area uh, in the suburbs to the city uh, center. Each line has been developed and is operated by a private company and they are profitable railway businesses. Yeah. Uh, why are the suburban lines uh, achieving business success? The main reason uh, of urban development, uh, uh, main reason is uh, urban development has spread out along the rail corridors. Many suburban lines were developed uh, together with the uh, urban uh, development. First, uh, the railway companies constructed railways in undeveloped areas. Since land prices were not so high at that time, the construction costs were comparatively low. 
At the same time, uh, these uh, companies bought a huge amount of land uh, around the uh, uh, planned railway stations and developed, and developed residential and commercial areas. In the early stage, uh, though railway business did not produce profit, uh, sales of the real estate around stations covered the uh, deficit of the railway businesses. In academic terms, uh, this business model utilizes the uh, uh, idea of internalization external economy. Secondly, as the residential area starts to uh, <coughs> develop, the railway companies operate feeder commuter bus services uh, from the railway station or residential area and also runs up supermarket uh, for the residents. Uh, these are the, not only sources of revenue for railway companies, but also uh, they result in raising the value of residential areas along the railway line. Mm -hmm. uh, furthermore, the railway companies provide customer facilities, such as development stores, uh, amusement parks, and theaters uh, to increase the number of railway passengers. When the number of users increases as an outcome of these efforts, the railway business uh, segments start to profit on their own. Uh, when looking at the railway companies' revenue sources uh, of uh, private railway companies in Tokyo, uh, this is some uh, example. Uh, but the cornerstones are the transportation businesses, blue and uh, uh, real estate businesses is uh, red, and the retail businesses is green. So as you see in this pie chart, uh, transportation business is not so dominant uh, in their businesses. So uh, when these companies are asked, what kind of business are you doing? Uh, they are likely to answer urban development instead of uh, railway businesses. This is due to the reason I have just explained to you. Up until now, private rail railway companies who operate suburban lines have generally raised their investment fund by themselves, by loans from banks or uh, issuing the corporate bonds. On the other hand, as it is heavily populated inside the circular line, so which means a huge construction cost, so Tokyo Metro conducted the construction with subsidies of 70% of construction costs from the central and municipal government. Now, uh, Tokyo metropolitan area is fairly matured in terms of uh, railway network, but there are some needs of new railway lines such as connecting uh, Haneda and Narita Airport via city center. Uh, raising funds uh, for construction of these new lines are very difficult uh, due to the high construction costs and the expectation of a very small increase in the uh, ridership. Then, uh, as a sol solution of this issue, uh, we have f fabricated a new construction scheme Spend, uh, separating infrastructure from operation. Uh, to be more specific, a special purpose company is established by uh, uh, government and all private in investors, depending on the characteristics of the new line. Uh, the central and the municipal government bear two-thirds uh, of costs, and the rest one-third is raised uh, from private sectors. After the completion of rail facilities, they are owned by the uh, special purpose company, and that company leases them out to railway uh, companies for the operation of railways. Uh, from the revenue of the rail fares, railway company uh, pay the user fee to special purpose company over a long period, say, uh, uh, 30 years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and finally, the investment uh, is recovered. So the uh, <clears throat> since it is now very difficult to expect one railway company to invest new uh, railway lines, this scheme uh, seems to be the only realistic way to uh, construct uh, new lines. Okay. Perhaps uh, that would be the uh, answer to your question. Okay, I, thank, you well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. The scheme, you say, is one that is not yet implemented? Yeah, it is already. It is, and it works already. Yes, okay. it works already, yeah.
Brilliant. Well, uh, Mr. Melanifi, the President and CEO of the American Public Transportation Association, you've been in business uh, for more than 26 years, have a lot of leadership experience there, so, and you also represent a huge number of operators in the United States, obviously. Perhaps you can tell us how they raise money. Maybe a similar scheme like that. Happy to, happy to do that, Monica. Thank you. It's an honor to be here with this wonderful group of, of esteemed colleagues up here on the panel. And APTA has been around since 1882, and we're coming off a great year. We had our second highest ridership in the U.S. since 1957. We had 10.5 billion trips on public transport. So it was a very good story. On the one hand, yet financing is an interesting story for us. We have three different primary funding sources. We have the federal government, we have state government, and then we have local government in connection with the, the fare structure. The federal government tends to uh, provide capital dollars uh, on, an, on a match basis, either 50, on a range from 50 to 80 percent, depending on the project. And those federal dollars come from a federal gas tax. 18.4 uh, cents on the gallon uh, for fuel goes into a highway and transit trust fund. However, the last time that tax was raised was in uh, 1993, 20 years ago. So those dollars have lost 38 percent of their value over the last 20 years, so they're buying less when we, our demands are going up. And the demand has gone up so much that the Highway Trust Fund is losing its value. Uh, by 2015, we're expecting that that will actually go insolvent. Oh, what effect we'll, will that have then? Oh, it would be bad. <laughs> we'll what talk you, about that. What are you going to do about it? Well, that's, that's our job as lobbyists oh. and, and educators and educating the public. The, the trust fund, uh, basically we spend $50 billion a year on highways and transit in the U.S. in the federal role. About $35 billion of that goes into the, is from the trust fund. So another $15 billion has to come from the general fund. So now we're working on what is the next dedicated long-term funding source. And I think you heard Peter and others talk about the value of long-term funding for big infrastructure projects. So important we have that. We just came off, our current bill is a 27-month bill. We're in the middle of it. And we had three years of extensions before that. So we've got to really get a long-term plan mm -hmm. to look forward. As we look at the state level of funding, 46 of our 50 states provide some level of funding. Some are very small and some are more robust. Our small systems tend to get operating assistance and our big systems just get capital. The local funding is very interesting. It's, it's different in every single system. And so our local funding, in addition to the fair revenue, we can have uh, various things from sales tax, property tax, income tax, rental car taxes, casino taxes, uh, all kinds of different things. And the latest scheme right now is um, selling naming rights to our stations is something that's uh, new and innovative for us, uh, certainly here in the States. Does that bring in a lot of revenue? It does. It okay. does. Uh, but I think the thing that, that is very interesting is that uh, all the local tax money is generated through uh, local tax referendums. So they have to have a local referendum if they want to uh, implement a tax on a local level. So those are the three different main components of funding for uh, transit in the U.S. Okay, well, but this, this, this local referendum is like a ballot. You go out to people and ask if they think uh, all, all the mechanisms, all the, these measures are, are any good and that they approve of it and are happy that uh, basically taxpayers' money is spent on it. Is, is, is it like that? And, and what were your findings then? You know, it's a, it's a great question, Monica. We have uh, uh, an organization within APTA that tracks every local transit tax ballot in the country. We've been doing that since 2000. And what we've found is that since 2000, we've had a 73% passage rate for local transit ballot initiatives. And in fact, just to give some scale on that, last year, one of the worst economic times of our generation, when we hear across the country and across the world, people will not pay more taxes right now, it's too high, we had 62 local transit initiatives in, in the United States. 49 of those passed an 80% passage rate for local transit tax initiatives. And what we found is it's all about telling a story and accountability. In the local level, when you can point to, I've got five projects I'm going to build, and they know that you're going to be held accountable. It's Monica's transit project. I'm going to build these five. They know they can hold them accountable, and they can see those things, and they've built that trust with the, the local level. At the same time, that's the problem we have at the federal level, because the federal level is so big, and it's a formula program. Nobody can point to this project or that is associated with the federal government, and that makes it much harder for us to get a greater funding yes. long-term scheme at the federal okay. level. Okay, so trust building, again, very important. Trust in dollars, yes. Yeah, trust, <laughs> trust in dollars. Well, uh, Michael and uh, Makato, um, please take your seats as well right now. Thank you very much you. for the time being um, because...
We have now the pleasure to welcome uh, another minister up here. He's the Minister of Transport and Telecommunications in Chile. And uh, his name is Pedro Pablo Erasuris Dominguez. I hope I said that right. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Good to have you with us. Um, and I actually, I remember, because we're going to talk about um, a kind of sort of privatization uh, initiative that didn't quite work out the way it was planned uh, and the repercussions of it, uh, the Santiago uh, incident, if you like. And Absolutely. you would like to tell us a bit about that. Please yes, go ahead. I, I think it's a, it's a very attractive uh, experience because uh, we started with a fully financed system that worked very bad and moving to uh, what was supposed to be a fully f private system that would work very well. And we had some consequences. <laughs> Uh, should I? So I have a small presentation. First point, and, and this is something that I would like to, to point out to you, which is uh, somehow the, the confusion that I got when I read this, the title of the whole Congress, uh, f Financing Transport. To me, in general, and the view we have, and also the view that we have seen here with many people that have been presenting, that there is funds, and if there is a project, there is good funds, and, and there's people eager to invest in transport. The issue is more funding deficit of transport. So it's more the operational issues, the, the maintenance issues, so where uh, normally governments have been subsidizing, and how do we do uh, with the growth or, or the increased quality, or even the uh, decrease in, in, in funding? So how do we cope with that? We had in Chile, a, a, a private system that worked uh, based only on tariffs and so it was uh, good when you had demand, when the time was right, so in any area where the demand was low or when the time, say late at night or uh, during low hours, uh, you would have no, no service. So really the system would work only on peak hours, on, on and, uh, and you, for that, if, if, if it was private, so you couldn't expect any special quality. You couldn't put conditions on the system. So a group of experts uh, started designing a solution for the city. And I would quote experts between brackets because really uh, they assumed that they could increase quality. And we, we mean really high quality. We're talking about buses that were all uh, new buses, less than three years, the whole fleet. Uh, also... Uh, good capacity, all hours, uh, low uh, in, in high hours, in low uh, demand hours, all the day. Good technology, in, increase environmental standards, increase uh, driving conditions of the driver. So make it uh, real good. The, the thing was that it was a better service for the same price, and of course things didn't work out and this is some pictures of what happened that the actually the first picture is a system complaining about this change and the second picture is a picture of what happened with the system it really uh, took less they assumed that with less buses than than the, the real needed ones it was possible to run the system so it really failed and it was a real disaster uh, that caused people to to complain the government had to put a subsidy in place it was difficult because at least in Chile, to, to have a subsidy is a long legislation process. It takes at least a year. And this is assuming that people want to pay a subsidy for a system that, that had been working with no subsidies. Mm. So it was a real nightmare. And uh, of course, part of the solution was to increase tariffs. And that was almost impossible for the running government because not only they had made a mess on the transport system, they had to go to the parliament and get subsidies. And increasing tariff at the same time was a real nightmare. So they, the, the conclusion was to request for subsidies. And for the first time in Chile, we had to face uh, evasion because it was run by the government. So it was no, no one really caring for the money that the, the people would pay through tariff. It was money to the government. So it was uh, evasion started to become a real issue. And also, for the first time, we had to analyze the possibility of adding subsidies to a system that had never worked with subsidies. And when we did that, uh, the, 
what we found out, and this is something that happened only three years ago, so we are still on the process of uh, changing the whole system in Chile from a privately owned system to a, a system that is still operated privately but has uh, subsidies. We started analyzing the situation of these different cities in Chile and we realized, and I, I don't know if you can see this uh, slide, but what we are showing here is the number of buses that different cities had at the time as, as year by, uh, goes. So what you see in most cases is declining number of buses per city, not only declining number of buses, but uh, lower quality buses. It was re a real uh, systems that were dying. So actually, the bad news of the problem that we had in Santiago let us realize that we were killing all the transport systems in Chile. So now we are in a situation in which we have legally a framework that is granting money to the local governments and to the ministry to go and solve the issues of the different cities. And, and this means not only improving the, the, the number of buses, the technology of the buses, but also the infrastructure and all the technology that is around so that we have better controlling systems and making sure that the city, as we all know, uh, lives well with a good uh, uh, public transport system. One of the main conclusions that, that we come, uh, have been uh, obtaining with this process is first, we need quality transport systems to have quality of life. And this might be, for most of you, absolutely normal. This is something that was nor not normal in Chile. We would, uh, our direction was to have private cars running in the city as much as possible. We have realized that that, that is no longer a solution. You, and so you have to have good uh, transport system to have good quality of life. The second thing is that you have to work as high as possible with tariffs, and this, is, uh, this depends on, on the actual economic situation of the population. In the Chilean case, we have seen that we can go up to 70%, 75% tariff and the remaining uh, subsidies, and uh, this percentage is uh, fully uh, obtained through analyzing the, 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 the relevant uh, users of the transport system. So we, we see that that's like the maximum to have a quality system. And uh, an alternative for financing would be to reduce quality, which, we, which is what we had. And uh, of course, it's something that is not very, uh, is not acceptable today. Uh, finally, we, we have concluded that subsidies are part of life if you want to have a a uh, transport system that makes life better in big cities. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, I was just uh, uh, aghast listening to uh, you basically um, admitting that uh, it was a complete mess that, that happened there. It must have been very difficult for a government to turn around and say, oops, that was not our intention. There. We somehow got it wrong. But you also seem, it, it seemed to have been necessary to happen for you to learn the lessons that you just mentioned. I, I, you would, could go uh, further into politics, really. The attitude of, in Chile was that uh, these things had to be private, and this was the, the common, common agreement. So the system had to work based on tariffs, and, and that it should be able to, and feasible. And this happened in the previous government that they started the system, and it was a real disaster, and it was planned with no subsidies at all. And assuming that you could get to a system that could work in a very high standard with no subsidies. And all the discussion that we have had, and this was in 2007, so it's not long, yeah. too long ago, in these last uh, six years, is to convince ourselves that you, you need, need to, have, to have quality of life in cities, you need good transport, and if you want good transport, that requires... Uh, subsidies, because mm. there is no way you could do that for the rates that people is, is able to pay uh, without subsidies. And what about trust? We just heard uh, Michael Melanifi mentioning uh, that it's very important to get the people on board in order to support your transport system. I mean, a lot of trust must have been lost in those years. Uh, uh, absolutely. You, the, the, the project was called Transantiago. And today, Transantiago is a word to mean a disaster. 
So if you want to say, I hope things go, go, don't go wrong, you would say, I hope this is not a Transantiago. <laughs> and and this, on top of that, we had to increase rates, tariffs, so not only kill the, the, the image of the, tra the transport system, but also increase rates. So it was a real nightmare that we have been able to, to recover with, uh, with more and more quality of the system, and also adding sub, uh, metro and trains. So copying a little bit the Japanese experience. Okay, but it's still work in progress. No, no, it's still work, work it's in progress. Still work we, in we progress. feel that we have a clear, a clear way through it, so we are very optimistic, but we had a very hard times. Okay. Well, thank you very much thank for you. sharing this in, in a, such a, a candid way with us, your Santiago experience. And uh, uh, please, a, a round of applause for our Minister from Chile, Erasuris Dominguez. Thank you very much. Take your seat again. So, and I now will join this group of gentlemen over here so we can uh, pick up a bit on the various uh, topics we have heard. I would like to, to start straight away with uh, that experience that uh, we were just listening to. I'm sure you all heard, uh, heard about it before, uh, but is, is there anything uh, that uh, makes you alarmed when you hear this? Anything, any lessons that you feel you can learn in your own way? Well, I think, I think one of the things to come away from that is you have to, ha the public has to understand the role of the, where the dollars come from. And, and so are the elected officials. I think so often you could bring elected officials onto a transit property and ask them, where do the federal dollars, the state dollars, the local dollars, where do they go? And, and I bet they would have a hard time explaining that. And so it's hard to convince people to invest in something if they don't understand where the dollars are going. So I think that one of the lessons there was understanding why it's important to subsidize, understand how to subsidize, and where those dollars go, what the yield is. So I think the more that we can educate the public on the value of their investments, the easier it is to convince them to invest more where it's needed. Mr. Franz, how do you educate the public? What I see, it's a, a very good example in Chile is that uh, if the government won't a good economical and social development for the city and for the state, it, it needs to steer the transport system, to steer. This is very important. The service uh, can be pro uh, produced from private companies, but the steering have to be from the authority. Any more? Just uh, nodding? Well, no? Yeah? Um, I, I was, in the case of the UK, um, it, it seems to me that, uh, I mean, the lesson in London is already learnt, which is that there, it's incontrovertible that, that there must be some element of public money in a, in a crowded city with crowded streets to enable people to access work particularly and generate economic wealth. Um, outside London, the bus system certainly is, is largely unsubsidized um, and uh, 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 actually the description of Santiago before the changes seems to me to be um, one that you could, you could actually you could describe it in at least some English towns. The question there is actually whether the whether uh, good public transportation is a central issue for that town and its development or not. Certainly in major cities it must be because there's no, there's no ability to access the city by private transport because of congestion. It may not be so critical in smaller towns and cities elsewhere and certainly in our country although, although there is pressure in the major cities to ask for and seek subsidy uh, in many other places the, the bus network works quite well without it. One supplementary remark. Uh, I think understanding the market mechanisms and, and how the public plays its role is really, is really crucial. You've been so uh, clear and unambiguous in describing two mistakes here. I think that's very refreshing. Uh, the lesson we should then learn from other mistakes that's much cheaper than doing your own. And I think uh, understanding the market uh, function and uh, one key point for us in Copenhagen is that we have a very close link like what we heard from Japan between spatial planning and uh, transportation planning. If you want the private sector to take part in a direct agreement or just act the way you would want them to act, 
it's very necessary, it's crucial that you have a broad-based broad coalition so that you know that when the state or the city says that we want this to be developed before that, when such and such is the case, we do put in a school here, we secure the public transportation this way and so forth, then you have an, a basis for, for agreement and wor working towards a common goal. It doesn't necessarily have to be a formal agreement that helps. Uh, and it, whenever possible, certainly go that way. But creating a stable and good environment is really crucial for the private sector involvement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, got, uh, perhaps uh, we have a similar uh, <coughs> policy with Copenhagen. And, uh, but uh, I didn't mention one thing uh, regarding the, uh, Tokyo. That, that is... Uh, uh, as I said, the development uh, of the land uh, surrounding the railways uh, increases the value uh, of the area itself. Right. And uh, it will benefit the uh, uh, real estate uh, company, but also the uh, local government or central government because the uh, you know, uh, value of the land tax increases. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, as long as uh, uh, development uh, goes successfully, uh, the, you know, uh, the, the pocket of the local government uh, increases. So the, they should uh, spend uh, those monies. Uh, for example, the uh, development of the uh, railways or uh, some other uh, needs for the local peoples. In that sense, uh, uh, the lo local government or central government has a uh, responsibility to, uh, you know, uh, plan the appropriate plan for the area itself mm -hmm. by uh, using the uh, railway development. Thank okay. You. So the, the, uh, the private sector invests, gets the revenues, but how it's been spent, the local government needs to have an eye on it and, and a say in it in order to avoid a, a case like in Santiago, for example. Now, because you mentioned tax uh, and property, uh, uh, Pierre, as you also said, it would be, it would be good to use uh, property tax uh, as a, a means of revenue. Um, what's in the way when you say you would like to? What stands in the way? Uh, the policies uh, there don't allow it? Or? There's, uh, there's, we do have property tax. The key point is that uh, if I put in a project which raises the value of the adjacent area by 20%, I only get 2% of that 20% value increase. I get them every year, mm -hmm. but still. The key point, if, if I could make, if there could be made an argument that if if such a system is being put in, then the value of the adjacent area will be raised by 300 million euros, for example, uh, then I get 75 of them. And with those 75, we do indeed put in the transportation system. Without those 75, we do not. Mm -hmm. That's about the point about time to market. Mm -hmm. It's before you do the, make the decisions. And we can do this on a, on a voluntary uh, basis. There is a legal basis for doing that. But we cannot go in and specifically say that we take out 10, 20, or 40 percent of specifically increasing uh, property values. We cannot do that now on a, a, as a government or as, as a city government. That, that's not possible. And that's where the the, uh, the key is the, the TOD, you didn't get much into it in the presentation here, but the, the idea of, of putting together a package where you up front, uh, you put your money up front instead mm -hmm. of just uh, putting it in your pocket afterwards. That's the way. Well, Michael, you, in the United States you have uh, quite a lot of uh, various uh, revenue mechanisms. Um, you've got uh, all these various taxes, casino tax, uh, car rental tax. I mean, there's so much of it. Which actually works well in terms of uh, financing transport? We, we did a survey and, and found there were 28 different types of local taxes that were used to, to generate the local share. It was quite an impressive array from, say, personal property tax, income tax, sales tax, these different components. And... The sales tax was, is the one that was easiest to pass in most, most locations, and when the economy was doing great, it was a, a very good source for us, and it's 
demand grew, the economy grew, the tax grew, and it was a very good source. But then as the economy dropped, the, the bottom of that really right. fell out, and it was a real challenge. And, and as the economy dropped and fuel prices went up, people came in droves to transit, and at the same time, we had less revenue to deal with that. And we always felt then that property tax value uh, taxes, or we call them ad valorem taxes, would be more stable because properties values were always going up and they were stable. But now that our real estate market dropped out, that also became less of a, a, a stable source. And so you really have to look at long-term variability in each of the funding sources. And though some are easier to pass, which ones are going to give you more stability long-term and which ones will be there uh, when your demand is high and, and other economic drivers are down. So it's really, you have to look at each one uh, both from what you can pass, but also who you, who's going to vote against you, okay. so you can have that good balance. If you have to, if you have seven different funding sources, then you've got seven different groups you've got to work against, or if they're opposing you in a tax election. So it's okay. finding that right balance. So so it's a bit like financial markets. You have to spread your risks, but at the same time, you have more players that you have to sort of align and uh, get on the same page. Um, I would like to move to another topic in this uh, context, but I also start looking out at you now, because at the beginning I uh, hopefully said, and if I haven't done so, then I'll do it now, that we also welcome questions from the floor. And uh, we have lights now, so I can actually see your hands. And there's quite a few hands, so I will wait with my particular question and uh, start uh, in the front row, the gentleman with the red tie. Uh, you get a microphone. Um, everybody else, I will keep looking at you then as well again. Please introduce yourself first of all and then uh, ask a question. Yes, I'm Michael Replogel. I'm with the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy in Washington, D.C. I want to compliment uh, everyone for a fine panel discussion. I've moderated a panel on Wednesday morning here at the conference on advancing national urban transport policy. And we covered some of the same ground here and also, like this panel, concluded that public transportation really needs to be funded by more than fair revenue and needs stable long-term financing sources. We also focused a lot of our discussion on the need to develop better coordination across institutions to help create a better environment for operating and managing and planning transportation and fitting it into the broader environment of land use and resource management, and also the need to focus on capacity building, both people and institutions. And I wonder if our panelists could reflect on how those two elements, capacity building and institutional coordination, affect the environment in which our transportation providers go out and seek adequate long-term revenue sources and the consent of the public for those. Mm -hmm. Peter. So uh, I, I think the, uh, the relationship building is fundamental. I've come to realize that actually the uh, advocacy of transport projects is best done by business, not by transport people. Uh, when I turn up in uh, government departments, they, they look at you as though, uh, well, you would, you would want more money, wouldn't you? You'd always want more money. You always want better systems, you want better assets, you want, you know, the, the demand's insatiable. Uh, and I think that the real success that we've had in the UK, uh, is certainly in London, has been persuading business institutions and business organisations that our agenda is the same as theirs. So if they have, uh, it, it, the, the, so their, their aspiration to uh, make more money, to expand business in general, um, is uh, frustrated by the lack of adequate transport for people to get to work, to move around the city, then their, their advocacy is more powerful than mine. We have uh, London First, which is the business institutions in London, the London region of the Confederation of British Industry, the London Chamber of Commerce. Um, all of these people are central in making my case to government about increased funding, about asset replacement and about uh, new lines. So in the case of Crossrail, which is a new regional scheme across London, um, it was they who persuaded government that without it the city would not uh, continue to expand as a financial services centre. Mm -hmm. Government in turn said to business, 
you have to find a way of putting money into this scheme. They then assented to a very unusual tax regime to further tax business space in, 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 um, in properties valued over £50,000 uh, a, a year. So, so actually, th this seems to me to be a very fruitful partnership. I don't think we would ever have got the funding for Crossrail. Uh, they are my partners in advocating it for, to government the renewal of the assets of the Metro. Um, they will be our partners in launching the next Crossrail, the next Cross London Rail scheme, which is needed because the city is still expanding. And they, in turn, at some stage, will have to invent yet another tax mechanism, which their own membership will accept in order to pay for parts of that scheme. Okay, so it's about getting the beneficiaries uh, of the whole transport system uh, on board and to a certain extent fight your battle. Yes, absolutely. On the, on the point of the capacity building uh, and the integration, I think it's, uh, it's really a, a key point. The uh, Danish Ministry of Transportation has just uh, re-evaluated a public transportation organizational law and they have concluded that uh, you need a kind of an umbrella between the, to, to secure that it's not a bunch of nice chairs, but yet chairs, not a sofa. Uh, we offer people too many things fall between the chairs, the interchanges, the intermodal information, marketing, uh, ticketing, a lot of different areas, kind of every, each of the pillars are actually, they're pretty good. But, uh, but it's, it's, the, it's a total offer which can be improved a lot, not by a lot of money, but actually just by organizational um, maturity, I would say. It's an interesting point. They made this uh, criticism and then they asked the uh, companies themselves to come up with an umbrella. And uh, of course then with the iron fist in the velvet glove, if they didn't come up with a good solution, then they'll suggest something themselves from the ministry. And it appears that it has got a, a good tailwind uh, from, uh, in, in the companies that are actually really trying to improve on the intermodality, the interchanges, and, and all this from an organizational point of view. It doesn't mean more money. Uh, that's not the idea, but the idea is spending your money more wisely. Mm -hmm. I have one point I'd like to make. I don't know if it's uh, really um, how it should be, but I'd like to ask our host for a favor. Uh, when we make transportation planning in, uh, in Denmark and in other countries, I think, then we make uh, society effects. We try to calculate how good is this for society as a whole. But in my view, these, uh, these calculations are often way too narrow. They are just focusing on transportation. In London, they have uh, defined a new concept, wider economic benefits. Uh, and I would think uh, this is a, a way to calculate also what are the effects on, on the labor markets and, and property values and so forth, so that you get a full package. I think it would be extremely good if uh, if OECD could go in and help us on the mechanisms of how to put together such a, such a, a package of analysis because right now we make the analysis and say it doesn't look too good but there are all these good things we didn't bring in so it is a good idea anyhow. It would be nice if there was some kind of stable framework that we could work from and the blue stamp from Mr. Viegas would uh, certainly be a plus. Thank you very much. I think what Peter said is one uh, side of the coin. The other side is we have to discuss the advantages and the economical and the social effects uh, with the passenger. And in the past, especially in Germany, we had very strong organizations uh, for car users, very strong. And they had a very big influence uh, to the politics. And you know, we have more and more passenger organization and we discuss very often the effects with, with these organizations and they bring it in the public, bring it in the, to the journalists and it, uh, they discuss it. And then it's for political decision maker not easy to uh, put, say, uh, to the side. Mm -hmm. They have to 
discuss it and to have to uh, bring it uh, in the in the uh, uh, in the discussion and have to look what can they do. This is for us very important that we bring the passengers, the users in in the discussion. It is helpful. And the other side is uh, in, in Europe, the European Union in the past helps a lot to discuss the problems of uh, transport, special car transport. And uh, they have uh, many studies that uh, uh, average car driver brings costs for the society from more than 1,000 euro per year. And nobody, nobody pays for this cost. The public pays for it. The, the taxpayer paid. And we have to discuss it and have to convince uh, the public, the decision makers, that public transport is very important for the development, for the mid sized and long term development. Thank you. There were so many arms still up. I'm starting now over there. The gentleman with the blue tie. Thank you very much for your great vision, Mr. Franz and Mr. Alts. Uh, I would underline that 100% uh, as representing the Cyclist uh, Federation in Brussels, European Cyclist Federation. I just would like to add one benefit, and this is the health benefit. The lack of physical activity of the people in, in all over the world does bring so m much cost for the health sector that we should take in account, if we talk about funding, that more physical activity on a daily basis, you can calculate this in your systems, will bring a lot of savings in the health sector. So my message is, and my question is, is it not good to save money by investing in cycling? Thank you very much. I'm sure we will see you again in a month in uh, Vienna at Velocity, <laughs> where we can uh, go deeper into that. But cycling, obviously, is also a big issue for Copenhagen and Berlin. Uh, yes, we we do a lot about it with cyclists, and as I, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, it's actually if there was one mode to fall out uh, for uh, uh, transportation of people in Copenhagen, it'll be worst. The worst thing could happen would if all the bikes were flat one morning, because then things would really fall apart. Mm -hmm. When we make surveys, we can see that number one is that people want wider bicycle lanes. As a close number two, more metro comes. And you're right, the price of, the, uh, of, of improving uh, conditions for bicycles is, is much, much lower than for putting in, in more metro. It's also a matter of being, we have, we have a, a whole package on this. We just got a state uh, matching fund so that we are able to put in, in greater Copenhagen area, uh, for 50 million euros, we can put in a new super cycle highways, they're called, so that we can induce people not necessarily to travel 30 kilometers, but getting the average length that people are willing to accept, maybe go from four to six kilometers or something like, like that. So, and we have actually made the calculations on the health benefits, and that has gone into the total political package. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's something like if you, for every kilometer you, you travel by bicycle, I think it's, uh, it's about 15 cents that you net should earn. So, uh, and probably the crankier and the older the bike, the better. <laughs> and headwind. Headwind. Headwind is very good. There's a gentleman there uh, who's been there right from the start, and then we'll go over. Thank you, Chair. Dave Wetzel, uh, former London bus conductor. Um, I'm pleased that the panels recognize that uh, good transport does increase property values, but it is important to remember that properties consist of two elements. One is the building, and the second is the location of the building or the land value. And where, for example, in London, with this uh, supplementary rate, on properties over £50,000 per annum is applied, if next door to a building paying rates on the basis of 50000 per annum, there is an empty site, that land has gone up in value as much as the building 
but does not uh, contribute. And so I ask the panel, have you considered at all the idea of an annual land value tax? And I know the answer from Denmark will be yes, in the 1950s there was a land value tax and it was very successful. Unfortunately, it was a socialist government, and I'm a socialist, uh, that actually removed it. But uh, I wonder what you think about an annual land value tax. Who would like to go first? Is that something for you? Yeah, well, Dave was, uh, Dave was the uh, Vice Chair of Transport for London, uh, the previous Mayor, uh, and he's been consistent in advocating uh, this method of taxation for many years, uh, and it's clearly a very effective one because he's absolutely right. The, um, the way of paying for our current Cross London Railway scheme is only applicable to buildings that are built. Uh, it, won't, uh, it won't apply to, building, to, to empty sites, um, and in fact, of course, uh, after the railway is completed in 1819, um, the life of the tax, which is probably to 2030, um, actually people will be deriving benefit from, from the railway for many years beyond the life of the, uh, the, life of the tax. But of course, as he knows, it's a, it, it, it's a national government issue. Um, in, in Britain, uh, unlike the US and, and uh, some other European countries, uh, taxation is, is very much a matter for national government rather than local government. I suspect we would get a lot further uh, if London had the ability to levy its own uh, substantial taxation. Taxation is also not exactly very popular with the, the public usually, so uh, it'll be difficult also to sell it to them. Or any ideas on that? How would you sell that kind of tax if it didn't exist already? Well, about 20 years ago, we looked at initially uh, impact fees and said, oh, if you're going to put this facility in and it's going to put a greater load on our infrastructure, we need to tax you on that. And that was a, a negative tax on a negative thing. So it was a double negative, which is, didn't result in a positive and wasn't very well accepted. So as we look at more of the value capture type uh, enhancement, it's then you, you've got enhanced, you've got a positive enhancement of revenue uh, that's subsidizing positive enhancement of transport. So I think it's about the messaging as much as it is about the, the actual collection of the dollars. Okay. There was a, a lady. We haven't had a lady yet. Oh, there's two ladies. Oh, then we start with a lady in the front of the green dress that I saw first, and then we go next to you. Yes, uh, good morning. My name is Fuensanta Martinez from MASEA, the European Automotive uh, Manufacturers Association, manufacturing passenger cars, trucks, and buses for uh, public transport. I would like to comment on um, one remark made by uh, the panelist from uh, Berlin. Um, he was saying that uh, public transport is in competition with private transportation which is very cheap, uh, so uh, private transportation should be made more expensive and then people would take public transport. Well, um, I don't think that this is the right way of reasoning. I think that basically it is a question of quality. People want to or need to go from where they are to where they want to go. And um, currently, it's a very few cities. I'm talking about Europe, which is uh, what I know best. Uh, in very few uh, cities are able to provide this kind of uh, public uh, transport. It is the case of London, which probably has the best public transport in, in, in the world. And there, you pay for it. Uh, so, um, I think that we should try to abandon this uh, kind of, of mm -hmm. arguments of, of comp competition between private transportation and public transportation. So far, they are not uh, communicating, um, communi communicating vessels, and that, that has to be... Okay that has to be approved, uh, that has to be accepted. And uh, last but not least, I would like to remind the audience that 
the road sector is contributing by more, uh, uh, with more than 400 billion euros to the revenues of, of, of the member states in the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your contribution. And I've, I have two gentlemen very eager to, to reply to it. Obviously, you first. Partly, um, I agree, but uh, I agree special to the point what we should do is to increase the quality of public transport. This is absolutely agree. But the car driver brings costs for the society and have not to pay for this. And what I mean, if we want to increase the quality, and I'm, uh, so I think we should do it, then we need money for this. Quality is not for nothing. Uh, quality costs money. And so we have to look at uh, how finance we as a whole, and uh, especially we can discuss what, uh, uh, what things in transport are negative uh, for the environment, for the social development, and so on, and we can have special tax for these things. And it's not, it's not, uh, it makes no sense that we, uh, a very uh, um, expensive space in the cities uh, need to park uh, cars there. It's much more effective to bring people with public transport. And I think we cannot discuss uh, only in the big cities for public transport. Perhaps I'm a little bit different to Peter on this point. I think we have to, we need public transport all, also in smaller cities and in the rural areas. If people have the alternative to use public transport and the quality is good, then they use it. And it's for the, uh, the development of the rural area. One of the most important points that uh, the area has a good public transport system. We have special uh, scientists, they, they uh, look for this and they came to the conclusion public transport is more important um, as an airport. Uh, for, for investment from companies. So the uh, public transport system is the most important point to invest for a new uh, uh, fabrics or for new working spaces. And so we need a whole system in a rural area and in the big cities. And uh, we have to look and have to convince p political decision maker, they use mostly private cars right. and they have a driver and it's very convenient, and we cannot uh, bring this convenience in public transport, but we have to convince uh, the decision maker that they spend money for increase the quality in public transport. When you mentioned the rural areas, I mean, funding mechanisms in rural areas and smaller communities is uh, slightly different to those in cities. You have the demographic factor there. You have got a lot of people leaving rural areas. So it'll be even more difficult probably to but, get financing for it. But these people, they live there. They have children. Children need education. They go to they, the cities. Yeah, and they, have, they need a public transport. And we cannot bring all people in the world in the big cities. Mm -hmm. The big cities increase every year, but uh, we, we cannot fix all the problem if uh, we only look for the big cities. It's very important that we have uh, uh, good working big cities, but we have also to look to the rural areas that people uh, can live there and uh, can go to uh, cultural highlights or to education, to your universities and so on. And so they need a public transport system. And uh, from the whole uh, 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 sum of people, uh, between 30 and 40 percent have not the uh, alternative to use a private car. It's not possible, and so it's important for both sides. Pierre, you wanted to, to mention something, and then yes. we have one time for one last question, and I've already promised that lady, yes. I have a confession. We own a car. It's so old that we actually own it ourselves. It's no longer the bank. Uh, I think that setting up a uh, car versus public transportation is really, uh, that's not a very productive way to look at things. I think that uh, having a car, having, or at least having access to a car is in many instances a very, very wise and relevant thing for people, for families uh, to do so. 
Uh, we have in uh, Copenhagen, there's, uh, the car ownership is about half of what it is in, in the rest of the country, but is, is on the rise. But we can also see that the cars that we have are being used in a very different way from what in the rest of the country. People have their car for weekend purposes. They have it so that they, on Wednesday night, can go somewhere in the suburbs to play uh, bridge or whatever they do, to go to uh, late night activities and, and, and so forth. So it's very convenient for people to have access to a car. They don't necessarily need to own a car. And I think among the younger generation, it's really coming to the point where people want to have access to services, not necessarily owning a car. And that's why we try to, wherever it is possible, to give opportunities to shared car to uh, meeting points for uh, uh, commuting uh, in carpooling, uh, to facilitate having access to a vehicle when you need it and uh, not having the hassle of having it every day. I think there's a lot of the, on the intermediary scale between public transportation and uh, private uh, ownership and private uh, transportation, there are lots of opportunities uh, there and I think there is a, really a big scope for, for doing this. If I may flag for the organization UITP, uh, which is the International Association for Public Transportation, they have a focused work on the intermediary modes and the interchange between those, and it's, uh, it's really a worthwhile area to, to develop. Mm -hmm. I would hate to have a city without public transportation. I would hate to be in a place where a car was not available when I, when I wanted it. Well, there's public uh, transportation, like on-demand transportation, a taxi, and that is also a car, obviously. And because you just mentioned uh, the UITP, uh, let me uh, tell you in, in this moment that uh, if you want to know more about uh, various case studies uh, on funding urban public transport, the ITF and UITP together have put uh, together a case, uh, case study compendium uh, focusing on 10 cities and how they fund public transport, and that is available online now on the website of the ITF. Want, didn't want to forget mentioning that, of course. Now, the very last question, uh, and uh, if possible, brief. I will try. Hi, Anne Dupont from France, so French people are not short. Sorry to take the example of Chile, but something is striking with Chile. They have some of the best transport economists and transport sociologists in the world, and their reform was a mess. So I wonder to what extent this mess, quotation, is the result of a lack of collaborative process between researcher, the politician, a local government, citizen, and user. And if the answer is yes, which is a politically correct answer, what are your concrete expectations of, and the limitation you see, of a continuous procedure of this kind of collaborative process? Something very concrete, I expect. A concrete answer. I was just wondering, the first part of your question, if it shouldn't be addressed to the uh, transport minister directly as he uh, presented the case to us, uh, would you mind uh, taking this uh, answer? Do we have, uh, we have a hand mic? I think this was not planned, so we just improvise right now. Yes, we get a, a microphone for you. I will answer the political answer. <laughs> so it's, it is yes. No, but uh, clearly it was done on uh, the, the key issue of the failure was that it was done on a, an, an office closed circle with little information. And when you check the decisions that were made with the reality, they are so far that it, it was clear that it was done on, an, on a closed office without uh, enough uh, knowledge about what's people needs, politicians and, and technicians. And, and clearly the key difference of, on what we're doing today is that we're working, starting, considering all the, the players. On, and this includes the private o operators, which know a lot about what's going on on the market. Okay, that was that part. And you wanted to know concrete, in very concrete terms, the consequences. Um, I think I... I pretty much asked the question right at the beginning of the session to everybody, so I probably would have to uh, hand over that question to you as well, even though it is not a purely political one. Well, the, the consequence is well, uh, that 
that we've changed the way we're designing the systems. Clearly, uh, the, the experience of designing it in, in a closed office was such, such a dramatic result that the way we're doing things today is not only, uh, first it was done centralized, and now we're talking about local governments. Second, it was done without the in involvement of uh, public operate, uh, private operators were doing so. It was not considering the public, the talking to people. So it's a completely different uh, way of analyzing the problem and, so, uh, and presenting solutions. So, and, uh, and also one big change is that we did this on one big bang. So one day you have one system and next day you have a completely different system. There's some many jokes about uh, these two things, but it's not the time to tell them. But uh, now what we're doing is that we're doing it on steps. We, we okay. take key routes first and, and we do it more uh, in a more sensible way. Okay. Approval up here to what you just said and uh, pair, and this will be then already uh, ringing in the very last round. Okay. Uh, I don't know specifically enough about Santiago de Chile. I'll have to visit for a week during your summertime. Um, but uh, I think maybe inspiration could be found in the, uh, in the way the system operates in, in, uh, in England outside London because there they, it was, everything was completely deregulated and now there are different forms where uh, the private sector can, can uh, uh, integrate their services, they can make quality partnerships with the city, they uh, make contributions to terminals and so forth. Maybe there could be some, some inspiration to be, uh, to be found there. Okay. Well, inspiration I hope you found as well in this uh, two-hour session, which I have to wrap up now. We're already a bit over time, but we started slightly late, so that's okay. Um, I think uh, inspiration and also, if I may say, sort of a bit copying from each other or stealing from each other, I think you mentioned that as well, especially in terms of uh, value capture, is a good thing when you steal only from the best. And uh, if copying is better than inventing something that doesn't really work, uh, long-term planning in terms of funding uh, popped up again and again is very important. Timely value capture and obviously a good relationship with the beneficiaries, with the public, including them as early as possible to make wise decision. You mentioned, I think, Pear, it's not about spending more, but spending it more wisely. Uh, that is what I'm taking from this session. I'm sure each of you uh, will take whatever is most important for him or her. At this moment, I would like to thank Thank all my six panelists, and uh, you can thank them also with a round of applause. You can uh, take your seats now. Again, thank you very much for being up on stage with me. Um, I would also like to thank you, but not uh, yet uh, say goodbye to you, because uh, we have uh, the Secretary General uh, of the ITF with us, of course, and he would like to say a few words to you as well, José Viegas. Thank you, Marika. Before I go to my last words, let me give a direct answer to what was mentioned by my good friend for many years, Perals, about doing a study on the wider benefits of transportation. The secret is we're already doing a bit, of, a bit of that. We are helping the Bureau of the Grand Paris uh, project. They've asked us exactly to look at some of the questions about how do you account for the wider benefits of transportation. And more specifically, they asked us, when we are looking at this and that, are we doing some double counting or not? So it's really a minute question. But the reason why I'm saying this in front of all of you is that the projects we undertake are not by our initiative. Our program of work is brought forward and decided by the member countries. So if you are able to build up a coalition of five, six, seven countries who are interested in that we look at the wider benefits of transportation for a proper evaluation of how that should be considered, we will be very happy to do it. But we are not allowed to start projects just because we like it. So it has to be bottom-up. And 
I have, I have the support. There's the important notion that Denmark will, be, will have the presidency in 2016, but I hope you can get the coalition running before you get the presidency. So, now to the final words. It's been two and a half days since we're here together, and we've heard, we've debated, and we've shared knowledge. This is, I think, to continue a bit on the economic jargon that we've heard sometimes here, a very clear example of what we can call a positive sum game, in which the, sum, the total is bigger than the sum of the parts, and certainly for me it has been. As it is usual in our events and in all our work, we do not try to provide straight answers, but the objective is very simple, is to give you all a better basis for finding your own solution. And the own solution in one city and one country will certainly be a little different or a lot different from the own solution in another place. I think that what happened here in these two and a half days clearly proves what I had said at the beginning. The ITF place, the ITF summit, is the place where you have to go if you want to be enjoying this kind of benefits. This is the place to be. And so, clearly, I'm very thankful that you've all come and that you've all shared and you've all worked with us to make this a memorable event. All the presentations are available on the web now. There's video there. All the, the sessions have summaries which are already on the web. So I hope that you've had a great time and you're already feeling the urge to come back to the ITF Summit next year. The dates have been announced, it will be May 21, 23rd. I'm very happy because also I received a very long set of positive feedbacks from many of you, from those that I knew before and from those that I did not know before. So I'm very grateful to all of you. And I have to thank, of course, to the Norwegian presidency, to Germany and the German minister for hosting us, and naturally auch to Maya Jung, who's been a very good host at the local level and has invited us to go on the bike tour. Let's not forget it. Finally, my big, big thanks to what I like to call the two invisible hands. Adam Smith speak about one, I speak about two. The CCL hand, making everything work so smoothly, so even without noticing it, and not least, the ITF team hand, which made such an incredible organization without noticing how much work has gone in the backstage. I'm very grateful to both of them, and I hope you're also um, recognizant of the quality of the preparation work that has been going on and of the environment that you have enjoyed and for which you are also a very big contributor. So thank you all very much and see you next year. Thank you very much, Jose Villegas. Thank you very much for your kind words. Thank you. And um, I wish you, the ITF, the OECD, and everybody who participated all the best in the coming 12 months until the next uh, Congress. Um, all the best with the funding as well. I hope that the uh, economic environment will be stable enough for us all. And first, a safe trip home, and in between, if you want a fun bicycle ride, through Leipzig. Thank you very much for having me. All the best. Thank you. As a word of thanks, I should have given for the, trans for the interpreters. Yes. We had a lot of different languages going on all around, and to the ones that I have tested, the quality of the interpretation was superb. Thank you all very much for that. <laughs>